Hey everybody, welcome to session 182 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I am joined today by Dr. Kevin Luzinski, and boy, do we have a fun conversation. If you're not familiar with Kevin or his work, he is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He's also the director of the recently initiated virtual care program at the Monroe Meyer Institute. And like I said, we covered a lot in this episode. We talk about how Kevin discovered behavior analysis, how he endeared himself to his then coworker, now wife, and previous behavioral observations guest, Dr. Nicole Rodriguez. We talk a lot about universal protocols, hence the headline to this or title to this episode, uh, specifically preschool life skills, and to a lesser extent, the balance program, as uh, discussed previously by. Um, yeah, Kelsey Ripple and uh, other friends of ours at uh, FTF Behavioral Consulting. Uh, so we talk about what inspired some of the early preschool life studies, where things like balance and preschool life skills fits into the larger PBIS context. Uh, we also spend a decent amount of time talking about the, the role of preference for contingent reinforcement, something that's, you know, I just really have been having a hard time wrapping my mind around. And so we get into that a little bit. And then we talk about a topic that Kevin will be presenting at this year's Verbal Behavior Conference, and he's giving us a a kind of like a rundown or a joint control 101. This is a topic I really don't know a lot about, to be perfectly candid with you, and uh, I really learned a lot in his brief description of it in our conversation today, and I'm even more so looking forward to getting a deeper dive into joint control at the conference. Uh, So yes, the conference itself, the Verbal Behavior Conference, it's taking place on April 7th and 8th in Austin, Texas. It's also available virtually. So I will be down there in Texas visiting there for the first time, and I'm really looking forward to it. And if you are attending, please be sure to say hello. If you'd like to attend and you don't know how to sign up, go to behaviorlive.com forward slash VBC. Or you can go to the show notes for this episode, and there'll be links waiting there for you. We close the show, as we always do, with some advice for the newly minted, and Kevin really hit it out of the park here. He gave several pieces of advice, and you know, really I've been pushing guests to provide more unique pieces of advice because, you know, for a variety of reasons— um, but he really gives some thought provoking advice and some very actionable advice, something that you can you know, use tomorrow, uh, if you will. So, that, you know, it's not just some aspirational quote, if you will. So if you don't listen to anything else, fast forward to the end of the podcast and listen to that. It's great. For Patreon subscribers, we spend about another five minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so talking about his interest in the role that ecological validity plays in applied research. Uh, So he talks about how he thinks about that. Uh, If you want to learn more about getting full-length episodes with no commercial interruptions and uh, even uh, none of this kind of opening commentary, go to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations to learn more about that. Speaking of Patreon, we're brought to you today by institutional tier patron Green Space Behavioral Technology. Green Space Behavior offers cutting-edge supervisor coaching, performance and competency-based trainings, and organizational support for new BCBAs and trainees. Find out how you can optimize your supervision practices, improve clinical outcomes, and increase employee satisfaction over at greenspacebehavior.com. We're also brought to you today by HRIC Recruiting. If you're a new BCBA or a BCBA of any experience level for that matter, And you need an independent person to advise you on today's, let's be honest, confusing job market. Go to hricolorado.com to schedule a confidential chat with Barbara Voss. She is really the go-to person in this field for all things uh, recruiting and job search. All right. I think that does it for the opening comments. Um, One other thing I guess I would say is just go to the show notes for this episode. I've got a lot of links waiting for you there on the various things that we talked about. So, again, I think that's it for opening remarks. Without any further delay, let's get to this fun conversation with Dr. Kevin Luzinski. (laughs) 
Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sikoria. Dr. Kevin Luzinski, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? Feeling great. So happy to be here. Thanks, Matt. Oh, I appreciate you coming on. We've got a lot to talk about this morning, and I know that uh, we're actually going to be uh, together in, in just a short couple of weeks at the Verbal Behavior Conference. I'm very much looking forward to that. So one of the things we're going to get to during this chat is the topics that you're going to be presenting on. And uh, so we can dig into that. Uh, and I just as a note to listeners, if you want to join us at the conference, you can do so whether or not you're in Austin, Texas, or anywhere else in the world. It's available both virtually and in person. So uh, we'll have links to how you can sign up for the event in the show notes for these uh, for this particular episode. And so, yeah, we'll get, we'll get yeah, into I'm that. Just, I'm just, I'm so pumped that it's going to be at least hybrid, some in-person engagement. I am really pumped about that. Yeah, me too. I, you know, we, uh, have you, have you, when was the last time you were at a, a an in-person conference? Yeah, yeah, probably 2019. Really? Wow. Yeah. So, so New Hampshire ABBA did a did an in-person and hybrid conference in September uh, that was you know socially distanced and all that stuff, and uh, it was it was the first one I've been to in a while, and so it was nice to actually see colleagues from across the state. Uh, but this obviously is uh, that this will be a lot of fun with folks. I'm imagining coming in from from all over. Uh, and of course it's, as I guess it's the new normal, all these events now are available virtually too, as I just mentioned. So, uh, folks can access it in a number of different ways. I'm looking forward to going to Texas for the first time. I've never been. Uh, and so I am very pumped to visit Austin, but, um, uh, anyway, We'll get to that in a little bit, and we'll get to a lot of – one of the things I really want to talk about is your your work in universal protocols like the preschool life skills and other sorts of interventions. So we're going to get into that as well. But first, uh, let's talk about how you got into ABA, speaking of getting into things. How how'd you how'd you discover behavior analysis? What made you want to pursue it as a career? Yeah, it all started at Illinois State University with Dr. Carla Depke, who's married to Dr. Tom Critchfield. Oh, yes. That's a name I have not heard. I have not heard <laughs> Carla's name in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. She was so, teaching this course. I guess I'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I would just as, a, as an aside, I, I was at Auburn while Tom and Carla were there uh, for uh, we had a, a very brief overlap. So I got a chance to oh, okay. uh, get to know those guys. Uh, Tom, uh, much better. Uh, but yeah, that was what, Tom, that's what Tom calls the golden years of, of Auburn. Although I'm sure, I'm sure many people present day perhaps would dispute that. Sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to get you in trouble here. So, <laughs> so I was taking a Dr. Carla Depke's course on the principles of behavior modification. And like for the first time as a junior in college, like two things stood out. There was actually like a theory of humans with principles that were actually operational, testable, and honestly, one, I think this happens to a lot of maybe people who discover the field is it aligned with my own observations of like what influenced how I acted. Like I saw like the effects of reinforcement and punishment primarily in what influenced how I behaved in basketball in high school. I was like, ooh, this play, this explained a kind of a lot <laughs> of different things. Um, coincidentally, Derek Reed was the teaching assistant for that course. And even back then, he was a fashionable dude. He like tie, sweater, sports coat. <laughs> I am not shocked at all. Did, probably a nice watch. I would, you know, uh, oh, I, I'm sure. And he was like, just so professional. Although like I was nearly a straight A student, I must admit I was distracted for most of the course by a female student named Deanna Salazar. So not at, Le not at Derek's um, academic engagement yet. I see. Were you a psych major going into I that was. course? Okay. Yeah. What, what made you want to pursue psychology? Yeah. I mean, the, the typical cliche answer, like I was just interested in human behavior really. And I would say a lot of my high school experiences, I did volunteer my time to kind of work in residential clinics um, to help individuals with a variety of diagnoses too. Okay. 
Interesting. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting volunteer opportunity at the high school level. I just, I'm just trying to imagine how that might work in the present tense and, you know, with uh, all sorts of things. To My part. mom was a, a high school biology teacher. So she kind of, kind of knew about different things that were going on. I just said, Hey, how could I potentially help people in this way? And also make some money between, um, uh, between the uh, school years. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. So so it sounds like you 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 found a a very influential group of people early on. So that that's yes. pretty that's pretty cool. So I I've interrupted you like five times in your origin story already. So I'll, I'll I, I oh, want yeah, you to continue. This is, this is this is wonderful. So then, in like my final semester, I took learning from Doctor Kutchfield. Like okay. who I, I I had no idea that he was like who he is in the field whatsoever. All I knew was that I was a pretty eccentric and energetic instructor. Um, and I was captured by behavior analysis at this point. Um, you know, I applied to like 13 child clinical psychology programs. Again, this is my last semester in college, you know, for no good reason other that you had to go to grad school and that kids plus psychology maybe means child clinical. <laughs> and uh, after one of his classes, I, I got the nerve to say, hey, if I wanted to explore the applications of behavior analysis more, what would you recommend I do? And like, without hesitating, he said, I would go work at the neural behavioral unit at Kennedy Krieger, which is associated with Johns Hopkins Medicine. So I said, okay. I fired off an application to Dr. Sung Woo Kong and heard absolutely nothing. Well, back in the day, and probably to a degree today, I hunt opportunities for myself. I'm, I'm pretty deliberate in trying to still get what I want if it seems like it's a good thing uh, for me and everybody else. So I called Sung Woo directly, like, very nervous and said, Hey, have you seen my application? I could tell it was like the 20th in a stack of applications. The answer was no, but he quickly looked through and he saw the names Depke and Critchfield and he, and he it gave him pause. And he said, Hey, I don't know if you're good or not. I don't know if you're good or not, but the fact you had those two courses, are you willing to fly out here on your dollar to interview? And I was like, yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that. So I flew out there with like an oversized ill-fitting suit, as I remember, and Sung Woo pointed out many years later. Um, no idea what I was doing, but I interviewed fairly well and it worked. And I started at KKI uh, working under Dr. Sung Woo Kang. Honestly, I remember after my first week, he said, hey, can I speak with you, Kevin? I was like, sure. And he said, are you checking your email throughout the day? And I'm like, no, no, I check it, you know, every other day, maybe in the morning. I was like surprised by the, like surprised by this question. Remember, this is like 2005. Email was like sporadically used as a way to communicate in college and definitely not a part of like my routine. So that was like my first professional lesson. Like look at your email multiple times in a day, which now seems a ridiculous thing to be told to do. <laughs> well, you know, now people are being, encouraged to look at your email less frequently because yes. we've gone so far in the other direction with the ubiquity of smartphones, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point too. Like emails use like text. <laughs> so, so, so was there, was there an email waiting for you from him that, uh, yeah, yeah, it was like, yeah, things I was supposed to do in that afternoon. So yeah, I was just missing the boat in terms of being in the right level of connection with him. I see. I see. And, and so, so what was it, um, so if you're on the neurobehavioral unit, I, I would imagine, and please correct me if this is not uh, right, but uh, you were, were you running trials with, uh, you know, the sessions with, with individuals with severe behavior problems and the whole nine yards? That's exactly it. Like starting from ground level up, doing everything from the functional analysis to treatments, literally just trying to like figure out like what I need to do and when I need to do it. I, like, I remember being in shock of the mission that like we're supposed to believe and do that we can engineer how we interact with an individual who may engage in life-threatening problem behavior and to teach them appropriate means to get what they want need and deserve and then by doing so decrease problem behavior like i was in all of this in shock um yeah tom or, or carla did not prepare me for like what the mission was so i loved it but totally engrossed in like every moment to moment were you surprised by the severity of the problem behaviors if you didn't have experience with that population? I mean, that had to be a bit of a bit of a shock. Yes, I, I totally was. In fact, I remember my parents visited like, I think three months in, and they said, we've never kind of seen you like look in a certain way, just because I was just, you know, just getting so used to um, the intensity of it, the importance of it. So it definitely, I mean, it was, I think it was good that I was 
in really good shape and really young at that time to kind of manage all of this and handle it all. But I, I really was, I was like, wow, this is amazingly cool and amazingly difficult. Yeah. So uh, another thing I'm going to venture to guess is that if you hadn't already, you probably developed cat-like reflexes to uh, <laughs> implement these procedures and et cetera, et cetera. Yes. I mean, that, that to be honest, that's one of my strengths. Like I can't, I, I play basketball, which is not smart when you're like five, nine, can't jump, but my hands are extremely quick and I, I'm highly, highly reactive. So yeah, that, that served me well. All right. All right. Very cool. So, so, uh, what, what happened from, from that? How long were you in Baltimore at, uh, KKI? Yeah, I was there for, um, two years. So within my first year, I realized that, oh. I could obtain my master's degree for free at no cost, and it would allow me to be a better clinician serving the individuals at the MBU. So I like signed up um, for the master's course at UMBC. And I remember (laughs) in my first uh, master's course taught by Dr. David Richmond, who now is at Texas Tech uh, University, like I was totally exhausted after the abstract. Like I was so confused by like, why was the tech so small? Why was there so like no distance between the lines? Why is there so much jargon? So it was also that was even though I was a really good student in undergrad, that was a whole nother level of scholarship and reading that, again, took some adjustment for me. I mean, I was exhausted after simply the abstract. Mm. <laughs> um, and then one time we're out at a happy hour and Sung Woo looked at me and he said, hey, you should get your Ph.D., you're motivated and talented enough. And I think you should work with this guy named Dr. Greg Hanley, who, to be honest, I didn't know much about. Yes. At that time, he had wrote the uh, 2003 functional analysis paper and and many other articles. We have to recognize at that point, my goal is to understand the content of what it meant for serving individuals, not really who wrote these articles. (laughs) Uh, So uh, Dr. Rodriguez and I, we like applied to just KU. We visited. It was an amazing experience and it worked out regarding our acceptance. So that's how it kind of played out moving from Kennedy Krieger to the University of Kansas with uh, Greg and Rachel. Nice, nice. And uh, so how how long uh, were you or how long did that program take or how long were you out there for? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. So at at the University of Kansas? Yeah. Right. So Nicole and I both knew there was a possibility of of, of Greg and Rachel leaving to Massachusetts before we arrived. So it was actually only a year, but it was an awesome year because like there was such this vibe of getting things done. So it was like, I think maybe 15 months if you include the, include the summer. So mm-hmm. that, and then we transitioned to uh, Western uh, New England University now. I see. Very cool. Uh, and just for those who might not have caught uh, Nicole's episode, uh, why don't you tell the audience who, who, who this Nicole is? Yeah, she's like my better half, Dr. Nicole Rodriguez. Um, She's a faculty member here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, worked with uh, Dr. Rachel Thompson, and like is now an associate editor of Java and does a host of good work in the realm of early intervention. And let me just let me just tell you a quick backstory. So I already been at KKI for a year when she arrived. She arrived after doing like a post bachelor post bachelor experience (laughs) with Dr. Brian. Um, Iwata, and oh my gosh, he like came in so confident, so much swag. And like, <laughs> I literally fell in love with her probably within the first week, but I didn't like tell her for like probably three to four months. And the first time we actually went out, I like pretended to be interested and in know about salsa, went to all because she was like, a, she's a fluent salsa dancer and just did whatever I can to be a part of her world. I fought long and hard and I, and I finally won. Uh, she was amazing and still is to this day. All right, so uh, that is the insight that folks will not hear anywhere else, I suppose. So thank <laughs> you for sh- th- thank you for sharing that. Uh, th- so uh, I sometimes wonder, you know, I, I think the, there are varying reasons why people tune into the podcast, and I think little anecdotes like those that that uh, are, are fun for folks to get to know people beyond the titles and the the papers and the this and the that. So um, uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, and, and for those who. Uh, haven't had a chance to check out Nicole's episode. I'll drop a link to that in the show notes for this episode. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner 
and could help you find the perfect job placement. Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. What uh, what did you end up doing your your dissertation on? So it was it was on the um, an extension of preschool life skills, but I just okay. I, I would love to just tell you my first project ever as a doctoral student, if you wouldn't mind. Oh yeah. Yeah. Please. It's just kind of cool. It's on like, um, contra free loading. So let me first tell you the context. So we're at university of Kansas serve as a part-time teacher in this inclusive classroom, three to five-year-olds and contra free loading is, is this observation that individuals will choose to work to access reinforcement rather than receive the same amount for literally doing nothing for free. And, okay. and, and it was, it was a wild in my first year to like run these comparisons because like we would, Give kids, it's a, it's a developing kids, um, an experience in let's call this contingent reinforcement context or the work for it context. And they would have to like ask for to interact with me as they were like building something. And then the, in the next kind of session, the free context or the non-contingent reinforcement context, like I would give them the same quality type um, timing and distribution. So we kind of yoked all parameters of reinforcement. Um, and, I, and then after we gave them equal exposure and equate all those variables, and we said, which one do you want to experience this kind of work for it context for my attention or this get it for free context of my attention? And I was stunned to just see these children like choose for the work for it context. And then we like upped the work requirements and they kept choosing the work for it context until some point. Then they finally said, OK, that, that's too much work. I'm just going to get it for free. Um, so it was just a really neat, cool entry into a translational question somewhat that has applied implications. And this phenomenon of contra free loading um, has been observed across species as well. There's like interspecies generality, like Charlie Catania has some elegant work in this area. And actually Holly Gover in the last year, I think it's an early view, has a very cool review paper that details the degree to which you kind of see this um, with humans across all these different experimental preparations. And honestly, Skinner has something to say on this, too. He made this assertion. He suggested that acting upon the world becomes a generalized reinforcer because it's followed by a host of different reinforcers, more so than inaction or not behaving. So he kind of he kind of called the phenomenon before it was um, studied and verified to be pretty robust. That's yeah, it's interesting. (coughs) Excuse me. I've heard Greg talk about this before. And um, I don't know, they're, 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 I, I nonetheless have this skepticism of the concept just because I don't, it, you know, everything we learned about, you know, reinforcing increases behavior, yada, 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 you know. Um, so from a conceptual standpoint, it, 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 it to me seems kind of like a head scratcher, although it's, it's a literature I haven't delved into, certainly, especially into the, uh, the, you know, the experimental uh, uh, evaluations of this concept. So it, uh, have you, have you, when you're talking about this with students or colleagues or whatever, do you have people show similar reactions to it? Like, hold on a second. Is this, are you, are you really telling me that people, you know, like talk, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I think, I think the same kind of curiousness that I had is probably how other people enter into the uh, discussion as well. I think with the, the social interactions that I gave, it, it I think it, it made good sense where these kids were doing something and they wanted to call over my attention exactly at the point at which they wanted to share it. So when they were done building something or they, they needed help with something, 
Uh, and then when I gave that for free in the free context, well, they didn't want to show me it at that point. Or they didn't need help at that point. So I could see how they could really dictate the exact moment in time where the fluctuations of the value of my interaction rose. And they could then get it at that point where you can't get it if it's time-based. So that, that kind of made sense. But as this is replicated with, you know, I think in a, even, even a more translational study, we did, we use food. And they were just really just doing kind of arbitrary response. And, and the phenomenon still was observed under that context. So there may be this kind of idea of, again, acting upon and getting a contingent change is better than it being just delivered to you when you didn't behave towards it. Cool. Well, I look forward to checking out Holly's paper. I, I um, have not read it yet. So, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad people are talking about this. It's certainly something that, you know, is it enlightening to me? So I'm looking forward to learning more about that. Um, so I, I'm happy to keep going down that road if you have more to say on that. But at the same time, I'm also really curious about yes. the preschool life skills uh, and universal protocols more generally. Uh, so with regard to that, what uh, you know? So I know there's the uh, the, the the PLS study. Um, Oh, uh, what, uh, rem you'll have to remind me what year that came out. Um, yeah, 2007. Okay. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about that. What were the issues that you were seeing? What was the problem you were trying to solve? Uh, I I'd like to hear any kind of background in terms of how the, how the intervention was conceptualized and yeah, know, things like that. So I came pretty much right after the original was done. And I'll, I'll detail kind of my extension of it, but let me talk about the original a little bit uh, to answer your question directly is, so it, it, it came from multiple points, which is kind of neat. So this is um, the preschool life skills was designed to be implemented class-wide with children of neurotypical development and children with a variety of other diagnoses and disorders. And the idea it came from this like multi-million dollar study by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, where they like watched and interviewed parents and teachers of about a thousand children. And they found that like sending your child to center-based child care was correlated with like lower social competence, like higher conflict between adults and peers and more observable externalizing problem behavior. And in fact, I even think a couple of um, the parents brought this to Greg's attention about like, hey, you run this child development center as a part of U University of Kansas. How are you getting in front of this? And the answer was, after some honest reflection, I believe, not enough. So then it was like, OK, how do we take the treatment approaches um, from functional communication and delay tolerance from the severe behavioral literature and kind of do that in advance. So teaching requests for stuff, teaching requests for attention, teaching requests for help, and then introduce delays to make them more feasible when we cannot honor those requests. But there's two other sources that actually had a huge influence uh, on it as well. And those were, what did kindergarten teachers, what did they judge as the major concerns of, of children who are coming from preschool to become kindergartners in their classroom? And then second, what did they view as meaning a child is ready, school readiness skills? So those two literature themes kind of, kind of um, highlighted four major things. Kindergarten teachers really want the child to be able to communicate wants and needs. That was nice because that, 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 that complements the functional communication literature. Cooperate in groups, instruction following, and showing kindness to others. So the key point that kind of came up over and over again with these kind of ranking of priorities was that academic skills, pre-academic skills were not the top priority. They were important, but the teachers really needed children ready to learn by cooperating with instructions, paying attention. Um, and then from there, they can then use their awesome teacher skills to teach all of these other academic important goals. So, PLS um, applied class-wide is the units then turn into instruction following, functional communication, delay tolerance, and friendship, because that's exactly what those kind of three literatures said that you should do if you want to do your best job with these kind of preschool children. And honestly, I've recently, so I didn't, I have not done a lot of class-wide, as I'll talk a lot in a little bit, is I'm more to have done small group applications of the preschool life skills. But I recently observed Tony Camilleri. Um, consulting on PLS in upper state cerebral palsy in Nebraska, actually, 
and in autism clinics in Hawaii and via Zoom. So it's been really cool to see how talented Tony is in terms of like celebrating these small wins and empowering teachers and clinicians to do PLS uh, via Zoom. And the main way it's done is through these kind of video snippets of the implementation of these trials. So that's been a really neat thing to see. I got involved in PLS to answer um, two different questions. I think one is, um, what do we do for children who have been nominated by their teachers, who may be um, the least response to the class with intervention, those that really are presenting with more significant behavioral concerns in terms of aggression and noncompliance? And what could we also do to make the treatment or the preschool life skills more robust? So we specifically recruited children, the top three that the teachers nominate as, as warranting kind of more intensive um, preschool life skills uh, application. And that really boiled down to a larger dose of teaching, a denser dose, denser dose of teaching, and where performance-based criteria were used to make decisions. And we just focused on the functional communication delay tolerance units because those were mostly geared to kind of solving the problem behavior and promoting appropriate communication under those more difficult conditions. I will, I will say, Matt, that I think one beautiful aspect of recruiting three to four kids and, and doing preschool life skills in terms of functional communication delay tolerance in a small group is that the observational effects of seeing other children receive teaching, seeing other children do the skills and receive reinforcement. In that manuscript, uh, Luzinski and Hanley, 2013, we didn't capture any of that information, that richness, this, this whole observational learning dynamic in the public manuscript, because we, just, we took a data on a lot of things, but not those. And there also are some measurement challenges with determining, is the kid looking and learning? You have to do some particular tests to kind of figure that out. But the neat aspect was kind of seeing how watching their peers likely had multiple effects on them. Like one, they got to witness the entire contingency, right? They saw the skill opportunity present itself. They saw the skill and then the deliver of reinforcement. So in, in our case, they got materials um, for an activity, assistance, and my attention. And that could aid them in learning the skills outside of my direct opportunities. And then I think second, it also altered motivation. Like they would see a kid raise their hand, get my attention, then ask for the glitter, and then they would want some of that glitter. So I saw like potentially discriminative effects in terms of it altering their learning of the skill, but also motivational effects to engage in the skill more fluently and more accurately. Because what would happen is like, um, I would present some materials on the table and they would have to ask for them. And you'd see all kids kind of stop, look at me and raise their hand. And they were like, they were like dying to know which I'm going to call on. And I couldn't call them all at the same time. So it had this kind of neat dynamics to it in this kind of small group format. I will also say that I really like how the small group creates this mini cultural pro-social behavior. I mean, this happens at the classified level too, but you can even see it more pronounced in a small group. So like, that is like the expectations about how to handle different situations becomes like second nature. Like I remember, okay, so we had this kid, um, so prior to his involvement, like he knew how to use his body, his actions to get what he wanted. And he knew how to avoid what he didn't want. And he was really good. He was a bigger, he was a bigger dude. Um, and for instance, he kind of realized during teaching, he could uh, control the situation by not uh, repeating my prompts for like engaging in the vocal verbal communication skills. And I was like, oh, and this is always a problem when we have, when we have a vocal target. I, I know this. However, he got on board and learned the skills quite well. And then one day when he was done, I was working with a different small group of children and he was kind of watching from afar and he saw one of the kids grab and rip the material from the table instead of asking for it because we were in baseline. And he like kind of like walks over and he, loud, and he loudly states, Deshaun, don't you know when you want something from somebody else, just ask them by saying, may I have, may I have the markers please? And like he had this incredulous look like, do you not know how things work here, buddy? Do you not know the expectations of this pro-social culture that you're going to get with Kevin? So it really kind of stamped into me the importance of getting every student and every teacher on board with prioritizing these skills and making it the norm of the classroom, making it the norm of the small group, making it the norm of the home. Hey everyone, as a BCBA, meeting your continuing ed needs can be challenging at times. 
That's why I have made selected episodes of the Behavioral Observations Podcast available for Type 2 Continuing Education credits. That's right. You can meet a portion of your professional development requirements on the go. Currently, we have CEs for topics including functional assessment, ethics, and supervision. Come learn from podcast favorites such as Greg Hanley, Pat Fryman, Mark Dixon, as well as many other amazing guests. For more information, head on over to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEs. For listeners who might not have any background knowledge of uh, preschool life skills, uh, and I'm not going to make you to state all of them, you know, rotely, unless, of course, you'd like to, but yeah. um, can you... Well, uh, uh, so, you know, we talked quickly about, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, requesting and toleration and friendship skills and things like that. Um, can you go? So, so I guess I have two, two, th- two asks, I suppose. One is, can you go into a little bit more detail about the specific, the specificity of those skills? Uh, and I do know because I've downloaded it and shared it with others that the, the, the curriculum is available Certainly, uh, I think it's on the Practical Functional Assessment website, as probably uh, many other places as well. Yep. But uh, so, yeah, from my my recollection, it's been a while since I looked at it, but it's, you know, it, the idea is that it's taught at a couple of different levels, as you noted, the class-wide and the, uh, you know, you're just describing small group. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about, you know, how you would set up teaching one of those skills, Um you know, so if you can kind of walk us through kind of like a macro view of, you know, what are the what are the various uh, categories of, of, of repertoires we want to teach? Uh, and then certainly just kind of walk us through how you might set up a teaching interaction, um, I, I, you know, it, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, materials, uh, prompts, whatever, you know, uh, whether you're using kind of like a BST, you know, routine to, to teach that, et cetera. Sure, I would love to. So uh, getting global, um, for the instruction following unit, so that's responding to name is one of the skills in that unit. So we say the child's name, they're supposed to stop, look, and say yes. And then it's following um, simple instructions and then more complex instructions. Those are the three skills in the instruction following unit. For functional communication, it is asking um, assistance when something is difficult or too hard for them to solve themselves. Uh, obtaining somebody's attention by saying, excuse me, or some form that matches the child's communication modality and strength. And that's also requesting materials and then doing that with peers as well. So there's this kind of adult and peer component for the functional communication. Delay tolerance is tolerating delays to all of those um, requests where they have to kind of have a period of time where they do something else before those are delivered. And then the final one is friendship skills, which is saying thank you, um, empathizing when somebody's in distress, uh, sharing of toys, uh, and um, when somebody comes into your area, offering a toy and complimenting something they've done or something that they're wearing. So when a given skill is introduced, it's usually done when there is a common meeting point for all students. So that could maybe be at group time in the morning or circle time. Maybe it's also right before lunch when all the kids are sitting down preparing to get their food where then it's described by the teachers. And then typically two teachers come up and they kind of model how it looks. And then each kid quickly practices it with a teacher or with another kid. So that's kind of like the introduction of the skill. And then we've kind of talked with the teachers about, okay, what are the five to six points throughout your schedule where you could create a situation where you would do the skill. So for example, when would, when could you give them potentially a marker that you know is too difficult to open? It just, so they have to ask for yourself or, or to put the materials for the activity that are out of reach. Um, so we, we actually have them identify for their, their culture, um, what are these five points actually set it up directly to actually practice the skills under ecologically relevant situations? I see. So initially, from what I'm hearing, is like so. Initially, is more like role play, essentially. Yep. Uh, and then, and then, uh, basically, uh, you know, kind of populating the day with opportunities to practice it in, uh, I guess, more naturalistic circumstances. I think that the naturalistic is what we really try to emphasize in terms of making those um, delivery of sorry, the, the arrangement of the teaching opportunity and the reinforcers to be already a part, already in the classroom. So I mean, genuinely 
natural reinforcers rather than alternative or contrived reinforcers. So we can really make sure that the skill will generalize and be relevant to what they do versus adding kind of new things on top of their already um, complex schedule and programming. So I think many listeners can wrap their minds around how to engineer situations to evoke, uh, you know, direction following and asking for help and things along those lines. Uh, how how would, would you get into some of the, the, the empathy skills and how, how, what, what are some ways in which folks can, can create those, those kind of naturalistic learning opportunities to capitalize on some of that teaching that occurs outside of the role play direct instruction context? Yeah. The empathy, the empathy stuff, because that involves somebody um, getting hurt to a degree and showing indices of distress. So a lot of times, those, I mean, those could happen once a day, a couple times a day, naturally. But the teachers, like we are literally kind of um, tripping a little bit. We're hitting our elbow on the table and saying, ow, in a loud way to kind of emulate what it could look like if it was occurring under natural conditions. And then when the opportunity arises with the peer and adult, then we use that as well. So that is, that's one that requires a little bit more creativity. And in fact, we kind of found that um, you want to be careful about how many times you do that because the kids can kind of kind of catch on. Uh, they can catch on to the lack of genuine nature of it. So we actually dial down that um, dose in terms of the number of opportunities to kind of try to maintain some genuine nature of it because they're like, "You're hurt again." <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, so when you roll this out in a in a preschool setting, uh, is the idea that you. I mean, I could see the value of teaching all 13 skills kind of sequentially. Do you stay on one skill until you see a reasonable level of performance? In other words, could you be, could you hang out at, uh, you know, following instructions for a couple of days until you see all the learners, you know, demonstrate some level of skill in that area and then move on to like perhaps, you know, kind of uh, more multi-step instructions or manning for assistance, et cetera? Yeah, there, that's a great question. There is a time element and a performance element. So I think the goal is to teach a skill a week or maybe a skill every two weeks with, the, with then the performance goal being um, at least 10 opportunities where you've kind of created the opportunity for this skill throughout the day. Um, that is outside the more intense role play when the skill is introduced and that you've seen the child engage in the skill five times. Okay. After that, that point, yep. Can you run through that again real quick, the, the, the 10 and 5? Yeah, so that you want to at least try to program 10 opportunities for teaching throughout this week for a given student. And then you want to see them engage in the skill at least five times independently. Those are like the goals. And if a child has not kind of met those goals, like you're, you're not seeing any independence, all prompted. And even when you represent the opportunity right afterwards to try to transfer stimulus control from your prompt to the original teaching conditions for the skill, you don't see that and you still see a prompted skill again, then that individual may then be needed in terms of a tier two or small group um, instruction so that you can have a bolstering of opportunities and even more stringent mastery criteria, also described as like a multi-tier systems of support. I see. Thank you for clarifying that. I want to make sure I had those details correct. So what would that, uh, that, that second tier look like? So let's say you have some non-responders, uh, if you will. Uh, what, are, what are ways in which you can program for skill acquisition for those learners who are struggling to pick up the skills in the universal instructional format? Yeah, I think there's a there's a couple of ways from the literature. It's recommended that then you would actually have these, let's say, two to five individuals have these separate times where you would have a small group scenario that would be led by a teacher. So you can really get five, six, seven, eight opportunities within a 20 minute period versus them being distributed throughout the day where there could be hours between opportunities. So that cluster of teaching is something that can be absent at times from the class-wide approach because you're embedding these incidentally throughout the day. So the small group allows you to have it more a more denser dose. Plus, again, they see their peers being taught the skill, so there's even more potential observational learning there. Another way is you say, hey, the other kids are pretty good. 
can we focus on these three kids and try to get and try to double their dose throughout the class wide um, application throughout the day? So maybe it's let's not do small group yet. Let's just try to double their opportunities throughout the day. And maybe that will be enough to kind of bolster them to be along with the other students. And then we can go to the next skill. I see. Uh, both of those sound like they make a lot of sense. And Matt, to be transparent, there's only, I think, one or two actual applications of going through class wide looking at less responders, going to small group or some modification, and then also doing a tier three, which would be one-on-one. A lot of times we've discovered how to do small group or one-on-one or class-wide, but haven't done the whole tiered system too many times. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So so you brought up tiered, multi-tiered systems, which is kind of something I wanted to get to. I think it, you know, when people hear that, they hear, and you, they hear, you know, multi-tiered system support kind of also, you know, kind of brings up the whole, uh, you know, kind of world of PBIS, et cetera. So uh, what I'd like to do is, you know, to, to what extent is uh, preschool life skills and similar kind of, I guess, universal pr- protocols, would, are, are those, uh, do those function as, would, would those like be substitutable as tier one interventions in those settings for those age groups? Uh, what, what would be the, um, I guess the interaction, I suppose, between these types of curricula and, you know, things that you might see in, a you know, uh, in the various PBIS, uh, uh, literatures that are out there. To be upfront, uh, I know of the PBIS, uh, PBIS applications. I'm not fluent in that literature. I don't study nor apply them. So I'll give you some thoughts, but I want to be very clear that there is a lot going on there and I may not capture the core essence of it. But uh, PBIS seems more flexible um, for the skills, meaning they really want to have schools choose three to five global behavioral objectives. Let's call them being respectful. Let's be them resp- being responsible, being safe and striving for excellence. Let's say those are the four kind of goals or targets that they chose. And then they kind of figure out, well, what would that look like in different contexts? What would that look like? What would it be respectful and responsible in hallways? What would it be respectful and responsible in the classroom or cafeteria? And then they come up with a list of what that would look like for their culture. So they're pretty um, um, lenient in terms of what the particular skills are compared to preschool life skills, where we're really dialing in on functional communication, delay tolerance, and these foundational, maybe we shouldn't call them friendship skills. Maybe they should be called kindness skills or just ways to be kind because friendship involves a lot to develop a friend. So maybe kindness skills um, and instruction following. These kind of core foundations that we actually don't think you should move too far from because they're universal skills where I see more flexibility in PBIS. So maybe another way to frame this is PBIS and the preschool life skills Seem to complement it. One seem to complement one another. You could do PBIS and have a focus on the skills that are targeted in preschool life skills, right? So I see them complementing one another. One being a larger structure, and maybe PLS being something you would embed in it. In fact, my my son, uh, surprisingly, he's a, a kindergartner. They do PBIS, and they have what they call like these power paws because rock like Rockbrook Bulldog is their um, mascot for their school. So he brings all these different. Um, essentially tokens and these power policy exchanges for different rewards at the end of the week. So I see that kind of system where they're trying to reinforce behavior that's related to their overall expectations of being respectful, responsible, safe, and striving. There's this more specificity, I believe, in PLS. And also, um, when you look when you look at other comparisons, let's just say incredible years for preschoolers, um, I, still see, I still see a distinction being that you can introduce a skill at circle time, You can read a book about it. You can tell a story about it. But what it really comes down to is you need to set those opportunities up and in those moments, teach the skill. So there's a host of times where I see a lot of energy and time given towards um, social emotional learning that involves labeling of things. Well, what would you, what do you call this and call that? That is very important. At the same time, to complement that with setting up the opportunity and arranging in that moment. Let me just back up for a second. What does like, What does, okay, when a team gets eliminated from the playoffs, a lot of teams are in the playoffs, they pay for that point guard to be flown in 
into their practices so they can they can practice under the most difficult conditions to prepare for the next team, right? They're paying people to come in to set up the closest approximation to the real situation in their playoff game. What did people do in the presidential debates who got eliminated? They fly in the people to serve as their debate practice partners to try to, again, emulate the natural scenarios. So I think that same idea of do some talking, but just practice the heck out of it in a relevant situation is where a differentiating a differentiating aspect could be. Cool, cool. I and I really enjoyed those uh, examples from different uh, different much, very different applications. So, uh, what what is the current state of the preschool life skills literature, and what do you see as future directions, potential studies, etc.? Uh, this is. <laughs> Um, that question evokes uh, this other response, Matt. I, I can't, I, I think we have to consider what the skills-based treatment from Hanley and colleagues 2014, if that is going to play a part in complementing, modifying the current go-to prevention curriculum, which is preschool life skills. So can I talk about that a little bit and about how we can maybe integrate or what the heck does that even mean? Sure. Yeah. So I was a little bit late to reading and and to reading the 2014 paper on um, achieving meaningful outcomes through synthesized reinforcement and the interview informed um, the ISCA, because primarily I was doing verbal behavior research, EIB programming, conversation skills, telehealth, and sleep. But <laughs> Greg, during a conversation, shared a pre-published version of Kelsey Ruppel's universal program on addressing emerging problem behavior in families' homes when implemented by caregivers. And really the, the skills in what's, what's described as the balance program derive from the treatment approach from 2014. So then I also had a student, Javid Rahman, who came in about three years ago, the same time that kind of Greg sent along the pre-published manuscript. He's amazing real quick. He's from Rowan University, worked with Bethany Rafe and he's just a wicked talent. So it's been fun to kind of discuss how do we integrate this balance and PLS? Are they complementary? Should they inform one another? So Matt, here's the things I can't unsee. And this has been, this is a problem recently. I can't unsee how we don't start with some combination of reinforcers. I, I do see the benefit of that is just giving the kid everything and talking with them and just hanging out. It is fun. Um, I also can't see how we don't tart, we don't teach delay tolerance and instruction following via what's described as like a response-based contingency. So what I mean is in PLS, you start with instruction following where you just start giving simple instructions, deliver reinforcement, and then make them more complex. In this other approach, you build functional communication and then you say, um, hey, I need you to go um, set the table real quick. And they say, no, can I keep playing? And you say, wait, I really need you to set the table and you have them do just a little very easy cooperation response. And then they, then they go back to kind of having their control. This idea about building what a delay is and having it be filled with an actual act of responding and then ending it following them doing something specific, this response-based delay fading. Woo, I, I, I have like seen it applications. And then the third thing I can't see is once you build up this period of cooperation, 30 to 60 seconds, then I think all kids have to get used to tolerating less. So it's not just that we sometimes have to interrupt your play or your time and ask you to do th something specific in your day at school or home, and I need you to cooperate. But sometimes I need you to give up. I need you to give up my attention because I have to share it with other siblings or other students. I need you to give up the current thing you're playing with because it has to be shared with a brother or sister or a classmate, or I'm just, I'm tired of the amount of screen time that you've had. And I need you to then do something else. And then when we, when we essentially have them tolerating less to potentially teach them an explicit way to do so, to go entertain yourself, buddy, by go playing with something else. I know it's less preferred, but go entertain yourself. Don't just stare at me and watch what I'm going to do with a reinforcer. I need you to mediate your time during the delay, just like you mediate it by cooperating in that other situation. Ooh, I just gave you a lot, Matt. Do you want me to pause for a second? Yeah, that's good. That's good. So what, what are, what, what, uh, based off of all that, what, what are some experimental questions? You know, what are some yeah. things that you guys are thinking about in your own work? What are some things, if you're a master's student looking for a, a project, 
uh, or, or, you know, if you're a doc student looking for dissertation ideas, you know, so what, what are some, what are some questions out there that's, that, that, uh, need to be explored in, in this context? I think, I think here's one. And I think it goes back to, I think it's, it's like, what do you get for free? So what I mean by that is your child's having fun. They're controlling the situation. You interrupt it. You teach them how to ask for it back, right? You got the functional communication. Then you build in where you interrupt it. You tell them to wait and you have cooperation going on. And then once you have that, I now just say something, Matt, when you have this, these kids that are coming in, and let me just give you some context. We have kids who are like three to 11. Um, some of them have been kicked out of school. Some of them in alternative placements. They're not severe problem behavior like those treated in the, in the neural behavioral unit or here at MMI. But there is notable concerns that are primarily the family's focus. And you get them cooperating. They kind of like learn the game. I think the question is from there, what do you get? What do you get for free? Like how, how far can you push the delay? Like how, how long can you push the, the, the delay interval? Um, so one question that Javid asked that could be relevant to master students too is, if they learn to cooperate and then you do take away something, are they automatically protected from that? Like, can they handle that without, expli without explicit teaching? And he showed that you can't, that three out of four kids, even though they were great at cooperating, when they lost a reinforcer, they did not know how to handle that. And we saw problem behavior emerge, uh, uh, occur or excessive communication requests. So one thing we learned is you got to really teach them explicitly how to handle when there's no expectation that they have to do something, but they do have to give up something and what they do under that situation. So that was like something we discovered through his study. Um, so I think there could be other questions too, like um, what's another one that could be for master's um, students are... And let's Ooh. recognize I'm putting you on the spot here big time because yeah. I don't think this um, is something we talked about in advance. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. And again, this is uh, Kelsey Ruppel's balance application that is a prevention approach was done with kids with ASD and so is Javid's. So it, like class-wide PLS one-on-one. -on -one. But I think one question would be, um, how does it transfer? Does it transfer right away to other adults because of this process? What about what about peers? If, if they're used to cooperating with kind of how adults can lead the situation in different ways, will this transfer right away with peers? Or is peers and siblings a whole different ballgame because their history is very different with adults? Do they have to be incorporated in the overall process? Which I can throw out some guesses. I think the answer is, yeah, we do need to include them. So I think one of the most interesting things that I can't get off of my mind are, is there a way to scale up the synthesized reinforcement, the teaching of functional communication, the teaching of cooperation, the teaching of tolerating less? Those three, I think, fundamental starting points in a small group. I wonder what that would be like. Can we do a small group of kids with ASD or, or kids or other kids and um, what would that look like? So it's almost like integrating elements of the preschool life skills from the 2013 Luzinski Hanley paper, but incorporating the intervention components from Rupel's balance paper and seeing what we get from that. Cool. One last thing. Yeah. Is yeah. Maybe it's the case that, and again, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. I think the preschool life skills literature, the evidence of it, the effect sizes speak for themselves. So I don't want to say anything that would be I think, I, think it's, I think it's really good, but I am very curious because preschool life skills when done class-wide requires a teacher to think about how to embed all these different opportunities throughout their day. And because the dose for the children can be so intermittent, it could be once in the morning, once in the afternoon or three or four times, is it potentially smarter to build student progression of skills and teacher buy-in to actually teach the skills in a small group of kids from three to six and rotate those kids. So let's say you have two groups of kids with six that are doing this with the two teachers and you're focusing that skill. And then you have the other rest of the kids are in their free play um, activity. Do we just rotate and do teaching in a small group? And then from there, expand it class-wide? I wonder, I wonder if we'd see even quicker um, skill improvement, which would then result in more buy-in and even see more confidence from the teachers because they can get fluent with this in a known um, center-based activity. I like that. I like that. You know, it, it's it's interesting. I sometimes get asked to work with kindergarten teachers uh, more generally, and I've actually suggested they 
start incorporating some of this PLS, even though it's, you know, the preschool life skill. I, mm-hmm. I always have to say, I know it's called preschool life skills, but and they they usually like, nope, that's awesome because these kids are coming to, to school with fewer and fewer skills these days. Um, you know, so, I mean, everyone has a kids these days, you know, kind of uh, story, I suppose. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, anyhow, uh, yeah, so that... Uh, what you just described there in terms of rotating people through centers where one center is doing, uh, I guess, non, non PLSE stuff, if right. you will. And then you have the, the kind of like this, maybe the social emotional center or something like that. You know, that might be a more palatable way to, uh, to, to, I guess, package this, this from a, from a terminology standpoint, I suppose. So yeah, that's pretty cool. So I, um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about. So I, I was going to ask you about dissemination of preschool life skills. And as I'm listening to you, I think there are a lot more questions and answers about the process itself in terms of integrating it with some of the aspects of balance and whatnot. So I don't know if dissemination is 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 is, uh, is premature because these questions are still outstanding or or or, or not. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on that. I, I, I understand that. Um, more research is always better. But given the fact that these intervention components, even the ones that were done in, in the 2014 paper that was geared towards severe problem behavior and RUPL, which is geared more towards emergent problem behavior, those have evidence in and of themselves. So we're just kind of, we're trying to figure out what's the sequence of them, um, what, what, how should we do it? But I think that could be discovered in a safe way through clinical application of it. And in fact, I think one way to do it too is um, after we've started recently, after every appointment, we, we ask the three C's uh, when we're working with teachers or parents. And that is, um, how confident are you doing what you just did during our meeting with, with, the, with, with, the, um, with your child or with your student? Because even though they're doing it, I understand there's reactivity to us. Like, just tell me, how, what's your confidence level? Let me ask them, what's your comfort level? Because you can be com- you can be confident in something that doesn't mean you you are feel comfortable doing it. So we ask them, how comfortable do you feel? And the third one, which is my favorite, and because I realize it's the only way to grow, is um, I need you to give me a complaint. Uh, we actually now in our social literacy surveys, we 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 don't say, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, is there anything that you maybe didn't enjoy the most? We say, tell me something that bothered you please complain about something because if they complain about something, then it really teaches us what we can consider modifying or explain the rationale for it. It it can influence us in a variety of ways. So you'll know that you've worked with parents, teachers, colleagues who are micro, let's just call it, I don't know, judgmental or engaged on everything. Those interactions are the most golden. They're going to tell you specifically what these little things that they didn't like that you could then incorporate. Like those to me are, are the actual people you want to gravitate towards if you want to get better, not away from. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I was thinking about this in a, in a totally different way in terms of, you know, we, 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 there's a lot of conversations going on about today about the, you know, the acceptability of applied behavior analysis as a treatment for autism and how do we, how do we get better information from both individuals receiving services and caregivers uh, to, and, and what's going on in kind of like, uh, you know, industries, if you will, outside of behavior analysis. So, you know, if we're talking on Zoom right now, but if we were talking on a Google Meet, you know, at the end, you know, when you conclude a Google call, there's a little thing. How how was the uh, rate rate the call? You know, and, and there's yeah. other sorts of ways. You know, like uh, I think my dentist sends like uh, follow up emails when I go there and asking about the the customer satisfaction experience and asking for those that that it, that that input directly. So I think that's that those those questions those three C's are are, are really helpful. So I'm I'm glad you had the opportunity to to share those with the audience. Hopefully that'll stimulate some thinking with other people who are uh, are hearing that as well. Um, so one of the things I want to turn to, oh, oh, actually, let me uh, back up a second. I was going to, I I do want to pivot to asking you about your uh, presentations at the Verbal Behavior Conference, but um, 
I want to also give you an opportunity if there's any final thoughts on, you know, kind of universal protocols or preschool life skills more generally. Um, yeah, I, we, we've tried to do a much better job incorporating um, indirect measures of social validity. That's through questionnaires, that's through informal conversations with, with caregivers, implementers. Uh, however, Craig Kennedy's paper in 2002, I believe, on the maintenance of behavior change as an indicator of social validity, <laughs> that's, the, that's what we want. That really means is when your consultation relationship ends and there's no more expectation, there's, there's no reactivity, if you ever come back to that home, that school, that classroom, that organization, will they be doing what you did? So I think, how do we get... Um, less reactive measures of implementation of some universal protocol or some other thing that can really teach us, are they doing it in our absence because they love it? So this idea of maintenance as the most important measure of social validity. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And then you said that was Kennedy 2002? 2002, I believe. All right. Yes. All right. I'll run that uh, reference down. I know folks will probably want to take a look at that. So all right. Very cool. So let's talk about the Verbal Behavior Conference and what you're talking about at the conference itself. Now, I just want to let you know, uh, I, want, I don't want you to give away the farm here, right? Uh, let's just be very transparent here. We want people to sign up for the, uh, the event and, uh, and, and uh, get psyched up for, for, for two days of a deep dive into all things verbal behavior. Right. So, yeah. uh, so you'll, you, you're, you're, the task in front of you, Kevin, is, is, uh, uh, is to talk about what you're going to talk about in such a way as to, uh, uh, whet people's appetite for this material and, uh, go from there. Okay. Matt, I wish through a podcast that we could impart knowledge that could allow them to be effective from just listening. I wish that was the case. That doesn't happen. So I'll try to do that. But I think listening here and also going will be critical and probably even more than that. Right. Um, OK, so here's how this all happened. Um, last semester in grad school, after tons of grad school, right, I went to grad school at UNMC. Then I had classes at University of Kansas. Then I went to Western New England University. I had to repeat some classes Had amazing instructors. My last class is with Dr. David Palmer. It's David Palmer's first time ever teaching rural behavior doctoral students. First time. So he's jazzed. I'm, I don't, again, I didn't know Dave, I didn't know Dr. Palmer too much of the, too much before that course, but I was like, ooh, I'm gonna nail it. This is just contingency management applied to different target behaviors. Like, I got this. After that first course, my mind, like first class, I mean, my mind was blown. I was like, oh my gosh. So one of those concepts that blew my mind, which I which I still teach heavily about in um, a very close version of Dave's class is this concept of joint control. And it's um, derived from um, Barry Lohenkron. Man, this scholar in the 70s and 80s produced a ton of this unique translational research on this concept that like I actually never was assigned before Dave's class. The idea of joint control, which is best done not in a podcast, but I will try, is okay. It's when you notice that you're responding in the same way to two separate like sources of information or two separate sources of stimuli. And that you actually notice that what you're repeating is the same thing that you just texted or labeled. So it's when like, for example, your echoic response to take out the trash, take out the trash, take out the trash, I'm supposed to take out the trash. And then you do it. And then when you look and you see trash in the garbage, what's that tact? trash in garbage, which means you took out the trash. So when the tact matches the echoic, we notice that our behavior is the same. And then that usually cues us to respond in a particular way. So let me give you another example. Instruction following. Um, put your backpack away and take out your pencil, right? So like they are potentially, if they're, if they're three years old, they may, be, they may repeat this once covertly. Then they do, the, they do these behaviors. And, and then after they're done, Again, how do they know that they're done, Matt? It's because their echoing of the instruction matches the tact of the environmental situations that aligns. And they usually then say, 
I, I did it. I'm ready to learn or whatever the response would be. Or in other cases, I found it if they're, supposed, if they're supposed to find something. So joint control is noticing when you're responding the same way to two different sources. But then there's also what Skinner described as a descriptive autoclinic. Then you re, you report on noticing joint control. Like, hey, I'm done. And that's that's a different type of response when you report about joint control. So my whole talk is trying to give multiple examples about what, what joint control is and some um, core aspects of, about it. So one, let me just give you a couple. Like joint control is neat is that it's, it's generic to any particular stimuli because it doesn't matter what the stimulus is. It's just how you've been taught to respond to it. It's a verbal behavior thing. So it shouldn't be controlled by any domains of stimuli. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be just auditory. It shouldn't be just visual. In fact, um, uh, like you could, you could, you could have joint control to, to responding to two auditory stimuli. So let me give an example. Let's say that you are in a band and you're supposed to um, match this tune as done by our professional, right? So like you play the tune, you listen to it, and then you try to replicate the tune, right? And then you're, you, what you're doing right there is when somebody keeps practicing, well, why do they keep practicing? Because their production of the music doesn't match the recording of the professionals of music. And then they keep going. And finally, you watch them, you just see them raise their fists into the air. And it's at that point, they've discriminated that their production of that tune of that music is exactly how they listen to the professional ones. So that their response to their own produced music and that to the professional recording topographically is the same. And then they're done practicing because they know when they go to band practice or whatever, they're going to dominate uh, when they're asked to play their part of the um, song. I see. I see. And, and does this, uh, I, it sounds like this, does this take place across a number of topographies, if you will? I mean, in other words, can you like, one of the things I'm thinking about is like, uh, I don't know, if you're at the grocery store, you're, you know, you may be covertly tacting the things you need, but you have a list. Uh, and, and then you see, then there's the sight of the items and then there's the crossing of the list off the placing, the thing in the basket, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things going on all at the same time, all for the, in service of, uh, getting the stuff you need. That's exactly it. How do you know that you've met all the demands of your grocery shopping trip? It's because you could look at your list, engage in a textual response, right? And then quickly shift your attention to your cart and see if the same tact exists. If there's a match between the textual response and the tact response, that's joint control, you move on to the next item. The absence of joint control in this case would then require you to change your behavior and go get that item, right? So what interesting the part about joint control is sometimes you're looking for it, that is looking for the items, and sometimes you're looking for its absence too, or sometimes show me what is not X. In that case, you're ignoring when you respond the same way to two separate sources, you're actually looking when you respond differently. So that's kind of a neat thing too. Like sometimes I remember, what was it? Somebody in class gave an example about where they said something and it was the exact phrase that they used, that their, that their mother used, that they didn't like. So there was actually joint control in that case was unpleasant because their response matched the same way that they've um, uh, their, their mother has responded to. So essentially, Joint control involves pretty much any type of matching um, situation. So generalized imitation involves involves joint control. When you see somebody do something, you're you're actually responding to that as an observer, and then you do it. And then are you discriminating that you respond in the same way as what you just saw a model? So there's joint control there, receptive identification. Like find cat. If you can echo cat, and let's say then I, I slow roll the pictures of a cat, dog, and a horse, then you could repeat cat, 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 and only one of those pictures is going to evoke a tact of the same response form or topography, and then that will then evoke the touching response. So receptive ID, match the sample, recognizing following patterns, um, answering yes and no questions. And then reporting on your own behavior. Like, how do you know, Matt, that you actually turned off the heater in the basement? Um, and like, like, the only way to, though, the controlling variables is that when you're, when you're trying to imagine back, is that you saw the dial on off, right? That there is actually joint control over what you did in that moment and also over what you're the question, is it off? Did you turn it off? Well, that matches your tact of your remembering of it being off. What controls gradients of your confidence? Well, 
I think I did. Well, why would you say that? Because you, you remember going to the basement that you, you tack the basement, but you don't remember seeing that dial in the off button, right? So I, I'm pretty sure I did. But the absence of a complete topographical tact of what you're remembering and then your question to yourself is not there. Cool. A lot of, lot of cool applications. So you're doing kind of like a part one and part two about this? Is that is that the- Yeah, uh, part one's going to be conceptual. Let's like, my hope is this. If you come, <laughs> you will darn sure know what joint control is in part one. Like you will be able to give multiple examples and you will get it. And part two is, let me give an example about how we did it to help older kids, five and six-year-olds, be able to follow novel multi-step instructions on the first time. And because they need to do that to be able to be successful in any inclusive environment. Um, and just one tidbit on that, one thing that we kind of discovered, it's just interesting, is that children, in this case, with ASD or, or artistic children, don't have a lot of practice responding to their own vocal verbal behavior as verbal stimuli. They're used to sometimes responding to other people say and do stuff, but not to respond to their own behavior as a stimulus to respond to. So we have to directly target that. Awesome. I uh, can't wait to uh, attend both of those talks and uh, especially this time around being able to do that in person. So folks want to check that out, they can go to the show notes for this episode. I think it's behaviorlive.com forward slash VBC as well. Uh, don't hold me to that. Just go to behavioralobservations.com and check out the show notes for this particular episode. And the sign up information will be waiting there for you. Uh, Kevin, this is uh, this has been a really fun conversation. Let's, uh, let's uh, close this out by uh, hearing what advice you might have for the newly minted BCBA, or as I'm starting to add to these questions, or, or, or BCBAs of uh, all experience levels, because oftentimes as people are providing advice, uh, even, even o- older practitioners like myself are like, well, you know, that's pretty interesting. I should think about that. So I'll give you, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best at this, but I'll give you four things. One. If you have professional funds and you're going to go to a conference, can you allocate them more towards workshops, less towards individual presentations? I say that because I just think workshops give you more meat and the ability to actually learn from it than any 50-minute talk. Um, And I recommend you motivating your company or that you work for, that you own, to have at least two or three people go with you so you can have some shared discussion afterward. Don't do workshops by yourself. Um, Two, I understand that time is extremely limited, but is there any chance that you could seek out an opportunity to observe clinical meetings from other companies or organizations? Can you sit through their their hour clinical review? Because sometimes seeing other models, not hearing about them, but actually seeing it can be helpful for you to adopt some things that can maybe influence what you're doing and how you're doing it. The third one is, I, I don't, in research, in clinical practice, I don't know how we can get away with anymore showing a graph and not complementing it with with videos. So if if everybody in your group cannot be able to see those sessions that are being represented by the data, I think you need to show videos that capture. I want you to tell me, I'm gonna show you session 50 here. That is what's in this video. And I would love for you to show me a video of a barrier that you're encountering. Um, Particularly show me what the error looks like in the video. Because errors most of the time guide what you do in terms of treatment modifications. Um, Third is soft skills, something that um, I've been uh, trying to get better at. So I think that that difficult conversations with with, um, difficult conversations, how to discuss things that matter most. I found one that's through an online platform called Crucial Learning. Uh, I have no relation to them in terms of conflict of interest, but to how to talk about things that are very emotional. I mean, you have to have a lot of important, difficult conversations with potentially staff, um, potentially with families. And I think how to do that in a way that can result in it be delivered in a positive way cannot be undersold. I just think that those soft skills probably matter as much so than any sophisticated program you're doing. All right. And the last one is I watch, I listen to Chris Voss's, he's a former FBI negotiator and his book called Never Split the Difference. So essentially, how do you talk to people who are have other people hostages, right? So the most intense way to start conversations. And he kind of talks about how he starts um, with these kind of high tense scenarios with mirroring, where you're really just repeating what the person's saying, but in a curious way, like, oh, 
um, you don't think you have an option or you're, you know, you just kind of say it in the curious repeat and then also labeling. And the final thing I mentioned from his book is um, this acquisition audit, accusation audit, sorry, is where when you know that there are some concerns or complaints um, that are that are not being specifically stated, but, you know, exist to start your conversation saying, here's, I know, here's, I know what you're concerned about and you're right. And you kind of list off all the accusations that they likely have about that scenario. So you can kind of set the stage that you're going to be real about everything that you talk about next. That's cool. That's cool. I, you know, there's a similar book uh, called uh, How to Have Impossible Conversations, I think. Okay. I had to write that uh, one down. That uh, I believe has a lot of similar elements to that. And uh, I think it's written by like a philosophy professor. Um, but uh, yeah, very cool. Very cool. Those are all great uh, uh, pieces of advice. Those, uh, so thanks for putting some thought into that. I appreciate it. So, uh Kevin, if people want to uh, uh, find you or reach out, they can find you through the uh, the university. Yeah, should come up pretty easily. All right, I will put uh, I'll put uh, a link to your your page, your faculty page uh, in the show notes as well. Um, I don't know if you have any additional time. I don't want to. I want to be respectful of it, but uh, yeah, this you- is so much fun. I have I have more time for you. All right. All right. Very good. All right. So we're going to do a few minutes more for Patreon subscribers here. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, I know you want to talk about uh, is uh, talking about uh, the discussion of uh, ecological validity and applied research. So um, I, I think what I'd like to do is uh, just kind of give you a, a just a couple of minutes. I don't have any prepared questions on this or anything like that. So uh, t- tell, tell me why this is important. And, and, uh, what are some things we- Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.